You're listening to the Modern Motherhood Podcast from All Mom Does. I'm Julie Lyles Carr, and this podcast exists to equip and encourage you for the life you're leading, the faith journey you're on, the kids you're raising, the romance you're nurturing, and the work you're pursuing. I'm so glad you're here. Loved this listener review from Acting in Africa. She says, Julie is my go-to mom podcast. I'm always inspired and impressed by the guests she brings on her show. It can be difficult to navigate motherhood and faith in this day and age, but Julie is giving us the tools we need to conquer it. Moms, this is your podcast. Acting in Africa, thanks so much. Such an encouragement to hear how the podcast is helping you in your life. So today on the show, this one is powerful. Get ready. She had an incredibly challenging childhood being raised by a mom battling addiction. And now she shares what those years were like and what the process to healing and forgiveness has looked like in her life. She's Sarah May. Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a delight. It's always fun to get to have somebody actually in studio. Yes. And so it's just great to be able to sit across and look at your amazing hazel eyes and be able to <gasps> chat with you about Aww, all the things. Thank you. And your studio is so beautiful, by oh, the way. I love thank it. You. Love, love, love. Well, it's relatively clean right now, which means that my master <laughs> bedroom looks like a bomb went off. <laughs> So maybe I'll show it to you after. Relatable. Relatable. (laughs) Highly relatable on all the things. And a quick programming note. Today, as we talk with Sarah May, we are going to talk about a couple of topics that are not really going to be suitable for little ears. So moms, go ahead and put those earbuds in right now so you can listen to this episode if you're in the carpool line, whatever it is. But we're going to give you a chance to put in those earbuds now. So I got to see you get to do something that is so precious and amazing. Mm. You know, there's moments when someone has handed their newborn child and they get Mm. to smell the top of that newborn's head. I got to watch you open up your book because you're seeing it for the first time in print and smell Mm -hmm. the pages. I'm going to smell it right now. Do it. Do it. It's awesome. Yep. Smells really, really good. You yeah. should totally get one. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Based on scent alone. It's really, yeah. Scent alone. Scent mm. alone. But before we get into the book, let's back up. I'm sure most of my listeners are very clear on who you are, but just just for giggles, go ahead and tell us how you perceive yourself to be, who you are, where you live, husband, sure. kids, all the stuff. Sure, sure. So uh, I've been married for 16 years to my woodworker husband, and I have three kids. So I've got uh, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, and an almost 14-year-old, and I have two puppies because obviously we love chaos. Of course. And I started writing about uh, 10 or 11, 12 years ago when I was pregnant with one, had two toddlers, and uh, my husband and I had we didn't have two pennies to rub together. We didn't have a car. I couldn't go anywhere. I was in this new town, little house. And he said, you need a hobby because I was depressed and lonely and bored. Yeah. So I tried like scrapbooking and sewing and couponing. And I was terrible at all of those things. And finally, I discovered this world of blogging. And so I started to write every night when I put my kids to bed. And so that's how I became a writer, like right. through all of that. So I write, I I have the opportunity to go and speak to women all over, which is incredible. I podcast, but mainly I'm a stay at home mom. <laughs> well, you know, I first became aware of you and it's probably been nine or so. I mean, early, it's, like yeah. early days of blogging, mm-hmm. because you were doing something at that point that I was not seeing many other people do at mm. all. You know, I was in the blogging world too. I mm-hmm. did not understand the power of it for a long time. Oh, none of us did. It was no. so pure. It, it was. was so like innocent. It was and... like it was like you know, scrapbooking online. I mean, yeah, that was we just wanted how, yeah. community, right? Right. right. Yes. And that's how it was for me. Mm-hmm. But I was still working really hard mm-hmm. to show that I was getting all the things done and everything covered, and all the kids and cute. Things. And there would be times <laughs> that sure I'd talk about my disgusting van or right. <laughs> when something went awry, I would do that. Yeah. But you were someone who early on understood the power of being mm. very, very transparent with your story. Mm. And to me, I think that as I look at how that has become a momentum now, Mm. particularly in the space for Christian women who are saying, don't give me more perfect. I really want to know what's going on. To me, it's like you were one of the inventors of the term relatable and transparent Mm. and raw and all the things. So Mm. when did that happen in that blogging arc? When did you decide, I'm actually going to let people in to see what's going on and what some of my backstory is? I think I didn't know any better. (laughs) Like people will say to me, like, I can't believe you said that. And I was like, 
oh, shoot, like, what did I say that I maybe shouldn't have said? So the way that God kind of wove me together, I kind of joke that I'm in the ministry of spilling my guts and not everybody has to do that. But for whatever reason, God asks me to. Um, I always have wanted to like uh, be a counselor. And the reason I wanted to be a counselor, I mean, this was like since the eighth grade, was I always felt like, what if you could just listen to somebody who didn't have someone to talk to and they were just able to feel not alone. And so I think for whatever reason, that's how God sort of just developed my heart and my ministry is that I feel like, well, if I'm sharing things, then maybe somebody will feel less alone. So I think it kind of started there. And then the the sort of second part of that is I have a pretty tender heart towards God. I'm not always good at obeying or surrendering, but I'm pretty tender when God tells me to do something. And the very first time I feel like I was really, really vulnerable online was when I shared my abortion story about 10 years ago. And I had gone through healing, I had gone through counseling, but I did not want to share it publicly. And I felt like the Lord kept saying, like, it's time for you to tell your story because others need to hear it because lots of women need to be set free. And I will never forget my husband saying, like, I know you don't want to do this, Sarah, but you have to do it if God's telling you to. And I remember closing my eyes and writing on my blog and like just writing this story and being like so scared to death to press publish. So it wasn't like it's easy for me to share things, but I'm just doing the thing that I feel like I'm supposed to do. And that actually putting that out there was the beginning of everything because I got hundreds of comments and emails from people from women who said, I've never told anybody, but me too. I mean, I have women who are in their 70s writing me and saying, I've never told anybody. Mm -hmm. And so that taught me the power of really obeying God because he has a purpose for that. And so I think that it's become easier for me to be vulnerable and to share because I see what God is doing. I'm able to see some of what God is doing. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy and it doesn't mean there aren't consequences. Um, I lost relationships with people because I shared my story from with when people didn't want me to do it. So it's a real fine line when you share your story, but you don't want to hinder somebody else's story in that circle right, or part right. of your family or whatever. So there are consequences, but at the end of the day, we have to follow God. So that's kind of where that started, I think. I think it's interesting you bring up consequences because I've laughed. People have said, when are you going to write about your extended family and, da, 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 and that crazy story you tell about? And I'm like, well, some people are going to have to die. When they die. <laughs> I'm able to tell a lot of things now because yeah. quite frankly, and it's just the truth that yeah. people are dead. Yeah. And it's not that I want to dishonor them. Like I still will write in an honoring way. But some stories you just can't tell because you need to honor the, right. that person right. when they're alive um, in a different way. Right. And I'm glad you bring that up because... Mm-hmm. I think one of the flip sides Mm -hmm. of this momentum that we've seen that again, Mm -hmm. I think you've had a huge appropriate and wonderful place in creating of being real with each other and Mm -hmm. being honest. And I have felt that wave coming in, in Mm -hmm. my tenure in women's ministry. And I think it's because of leaders like you. Mm. I do think what's interesting though, is people will sometimes see that example Mm -hmm. and then they will just go spill Mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff without the forethought. And and I'm with you. I mean, if God's telling you to share something in your story, you go listen to God, not Julie on the podcast. You Mm -hmm. go do what you're supposed to do. However, Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we've been awfully quick to have people start sharing things, telling things where there hasn't been the level of healing, the level of obedience to God. So what are some things people should be looking for? Do listen to Julie on the podcast (laughs) because that is really wise. That's absolutely true. I will have people who hear my story and then say, I feel like I'm, I should tell mine. And I'll say to them, like, I'll just start asking them questions about the circumstance surrounding it. And I'll say, have you gone through any kind of healing or counseling or process this other than just initially saying like, okay, I can tell my story now. Right. Because I'm not saying you 100% have to go through counseling or whatever, but I do think you really need to consider it and be before the Lord. Like I didn't share my abortion story for, I think it was 10 years after the abortion. And I had gone through counseling like five years before that, like God had been doing a work in me on several levels. I just think we have to be willing to give things time to process. Not that it's tied up in a perfect bow because God still is bringing things up that I didn't even know I still had to deal or heal with in regards to my abortion or any other thing I went through. Um, So I do think it's just we lay it before the Lord and say, okay, God, like, do you want me to do this now or should I sit with it a while? A good example, too, is even with my book, The Complicated Heart. 
it's the story of how I learned to love and forgive my alcoholic mother. But of course, it's for anybody who struggles with a difficult or complicated relationship. Um, but even that, when my mom passed away in 2016, I knew I was going to tell the story, but I knew I couldn't do it right then. Like I right. let it sit for a year mm -hmm. and then I decided to write it. And then another two years went by before it's even coming out. So we just have to sometimes sit with the grief, go through the process before we begin to tell our stories. Because if we're just telling them to tell them, I, I'm just not sure there's going to be a lot of healing or good from that necessarily. I don't, I don't know all the things, but, um, if we are truly doing it because God has a work for us to do in that, it's okay to wait. It's okay to sit with it. Right. And I, I think that patience is really important yeah. because I think that patience then gives it the proof. Yeah. You and know? insight and clarity and time right. and all these things. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think there are things we understand even better the more time goes on, allowing yes. it to kind of ripen. Mm -hmm. So In the Complicated Heart, your brand new book. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This is my so favorite excited. book. I'm so, oh, well, I'm very happy. So thrilled for you. And I think this is another interesting thing that comes out in those stories that we have where we've had something done to us mm. when we're processing that. Mm -hmm. How do you, you brought this up, how mm. do you approach that with honor? Because mm. I encounter some people who say, well, you know, love covers all ills. And yes, Paul said that absolutely. But it becomes almost this loop where you can't mm. really tell the truth mm -hmm. because that would be dishonoring. Mm -hmm. But to me, the root word of honor and of honesty is the same, that H-O-N. Mm. I can't honor you if I'm not honest about the reality of the story. Yes, that's good. So how do you make sure you're within those those appropriate lines mm -hmm. of loving the memory of someone well, right. of loving someone as a fellow child of, of God, right. even if they've hurt you or there's been abuse or whatever the thing has been, mm -hmm. and yet still tell the story right. with honesty. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you stay in those lines? Yeah, that's a, that is such a good question. And I get asked that a lot uh, from just readers in mm -hmm. general. So with, with this book, for example, so I'm telling this whole story. It starts when I'm 14 years old about discovering that my mom is this verbally and, and emotionally abusive alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, alcoholic. And uh, one just tiny example of the depth of the pain and just awfulness that it was, was when I was 14, I remember um, I was sitting in a bathtub and I was just looking at this like plastic pink daisy razor on the side of the tub and thinking like, I wonder if you can kill yourself with like a plastic razor. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to die, but I wanted my mom to take me seriously because she didn't like she just nothing I said, you know, if I confronted her about being an alcoholic, nothing mattered. And so in my, you know, teenage brain, I'm like, I just want her to care. So I yell out, I'm going to kill myself. And my mom says, go ahead, I dare you. And that is sort of the beginning of the downfall for me and for her. Okay, so fast forward. So 2016, my mom passes away. And I know I have to tell this story. And I couldn't have told it with her alive because I didn't want to hurt her. God had done a lot of redemptive things. It's in the book. It's really incredible. But I thought I need to be honest. I need to tell the story so that people who are in that really deep, dark pit know that God is with them. Um, but I wanted to give my mom a voice. And so how is to honor her? Right. So how I did that was at the end of every chapter are my mom's journal entries. Wow. So some of them go back to when I was like a baby. Mm -hmm. Some are what was going on at the same time. So like what was happening when I was 15 and, you know, my mom's telling me I'm so ugly when I smile because I have braces on and she's, you know, getting drunk with her boyfriend who's half her age and my ex stepbrother is abusing me in my bedroom because she lets him sleep in there at night. You know what? Well, then you have her perspective in her journals of like all the tumult that she's going through and all the denial because she doesn't even see it. It's right. so insane. And so reading her journals, you see this, you get something that we rarely get, which is you get to peek behind a life. And so I was able after my mom passed away to read all of her journals and to watch the progression of her own pain and wounds and sin. Like what leads to a person drinking? What leads to a person hurting their kids? And I know I'm glossing over all of this quickly. Um, but so for me specifically to honor the story, I needed to tell the truth. Like you said, I wanted to be honest, but I also wanted to tell the truth that like my mom was hurt too. And so it's right. not an excuse for her behavior at all. The things she did, they were wrong, but it is an explanation for her behavior. I can look and I can go, she never felt loved by her dad. 
oh, my mom had two abortions. That's why she checked out when I found out I was pregnant at 16 years old. Um, oh, my mom was accused of sexually abusing myself and my sister, which didn't happen, but she had to go through all of that. Like, at what point do you just get completely broken in life? So I think in general, if we're going to tell a story, we need to debate, um, is the relationship worth hurting? Like, am I still working on this relationship? Do I... Need and what is the motive? I mean, you know, what is our motive? Right. Is God calling us to do this? Um, I think there's a way to tell our story with honesty without telling another person's story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a fine line and you need to really pray about it and have somebody, you know, read it and talk with you through it. Um, but I, I do believe in being honest and I do believe in doing what God tells you to do. We'll be right back with Sarah May. Do you ever feel like you're living Groundhog Day? Remember that movie with Bill Murray? He plays a guy who keeps repeating the same day over and over, getting up, going through all the same motions. Motherhood can feel like that. The routine, the chores, the little things that need to be done, but have to be done all over again the next day. Does it make you wonder if all that day after day means anything, if it's important? Well, here's some good news. Yes, yes, it does. Little things are big things. And you'll get to explore exactly that in my newest Bible study from Abington Women called Footnotes. Discover the impact of the lives of four Bible characters you may have never noticed before and how their day after day lives have led to big impact in our own. You can find Footnotes wherever you like to buy your books and at abingtonwomen.com slash footnotes. You know, I think one of the things that we do when it comes to compassion mm -hmm. is we think that compassion is somehow a very clean and simple thing. Oh my gosh. But compassion no. is very complicated. Messy, messy, messy. Yeah. And so I mm -hmm. think in understanding, I love this distinction of not validating what happened right. to you, but having this compassion for the woman that your mom was, mm -hmm. the experiences that she had, mm -hmm. that tempers everything in a way that I do think is more emulative of God's mm -hmm. compassion toward us. And mm -hmm. it's a complicated compassion. It's very complicated. We're all complicated. My mom claimed Jesus like all of her life, but mm -hmm. she did not act like it. I mean, going through her journals, you would think my mom was like this amazing Christian woman. <laughs> But in life, if you knew her, it was like a whiplash. Like, what? Yeah. Like, this is not how you lived at all. But she did. She hung on to Jesus. But it, I mean, whoa, it was such a disconnect. And it just shows you what can go on in the mind and heart of somebody and how they can't see how they're acting. And I think there was, I think she was a narcissist probably, you know, I think there was some mental illness and other things. But um, yeah, I didn't become a Christian until I was in late high school, beginning of college. Um and when God called me to not walk away, like I hated her. Like when I got out of Dodge, I was like, like, peace bye out. Bye. I don't yeah. ever want to see you again. Like we are done. Right. But God kept calling me into relationship. Like he, you know, I'm reading the scripture. I'm a new Christian. I'm reading about forgiveness and love. And I was like, God, if you want me to forgive and love her, I mean, you're going to have to show me how to do this because I can't do this on my own strength. Like I hate her. And every time I try, it just goes into a dumpster fire. Like it's just bad. We're just tangled up with each other. It's terrible and like all the things i didn't know growing up like how manipulative she was um she would gaslight me i learned that term recently it's yeah. where you feel like you're crazy somebody is so good at making you feel like you have no idea what you're talking about right um like it's not a big deal you're being too sensitive like da -da -da. um just craziness and so what guy did was though he showed me like he took me through a process of how to actually love and forgive when your wounds are still open. Mm -hmm. And that's really what this, you know, the story is talking right, about. Like, how do right. we do it? Like, how do you forgive somebody when your wounds are open? How do you forgive when they're still hurting you? How do you know when to say, like, peace out right. and when to stay in relationship? How do we set boundaries? Like, how do we get straight when we felt so crazy for so long and don't know what is up and what is down? So these are all of the things that... um that God has done in my own life, I see, you know, and that God will do for anybody who's willing to bend a knee to him and, and surrender and follow him. It's beautiful. So tell me, okay. I've had friends who've been through mm -hmm. some pretty horrific things in childhood yep. and sometimes at the hands of parents, sometimes mm -hmm. at the hands of those who are in ministry positions. I mean, you know, extended family, whatever. Mm -hmm. Those are real, huge, tangible hurts. Yep. But then we then get 20, 30 years down the line mm -hmm. and the conversation is still, well, 
I'm this way because this because happened to the, me. Right. Mm-hmm. And there is still, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to make light at all. No, I But how, I do, we, how do we disentangle to begin mm-hmm. to understand, yeah, those things in fact happened and had huge influence. Yes. But I also get to be an independent sentient being right. at some point mm-hmm. and make choices moving forward. That's so what exactly was that right. process like? For you and I'm mm-hmm. sure and again complicated heart I know it's a complicated one it is a complicated mm-hmm. one but there are some real tangible things that God does because in his kindness he doesn't just say uh, forgive somebody and you're on your own figure it out right. um, like and 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 love people love your enemies love everybody <laughs> like figure it out I mean mm-hmm. he gives us an example and he guides us and and so for me and for everybody really if we're paying attention and we're curious and we're willing to you know face our pain which is a big key right there you gotta right, face it right I think that God brings, well, he does. He'll bring people into our life to help us and guide us. And he did this for me. And so one of the first things I God taught me to do when he was asking me to stay in relationship was he really needed me to sort out lies from the truth. Mm. Because I'd been manipulated for so long and because I, I hadn't known the Lord, I hadn't known truth, there were all these core lies that I had, that I had believed about myself. And I remember going to a mentor's house and her getting out this notebook and writing down a bunch of phrases like, I'm not good enough. I'm ugly. I'm stupid. I'm, you know, um, all of these different things. And she was like, Sarah, does, do any of these like hit your heart? And I was like, yeah, like the, I'm not good enough or, um, I'm not in control. I'm not taken seriously. Boom, that was a big one. And then she writes these other phrases like, I must be in control. I must be pretty. I must be smart. I must be fit. I must be um, in control. All these different things. These are the behaviors attached to the lies. And I realized that I had been living in a way where I believed this lie because my mom didn't take me seriously. Like when I confronted her about being an alcoholic, she laughed at me. When I told her I didn't think I loved her, she just laughed at me. Nothing I could do would make her like hear what I had to say and care about me. And that just caused this like rage, like this fire to burn in me because I didn't know what to do with it. And so I started to realize that I was believing this lie that um, people had to take me seriously. And if they didn't take me seriously, like if a boyfriend dismissed me or I didn't think he was taking me seriously enough, I raged. It was like stomping on a landmine in my heart and I was so angry. And it's because I believed that if somebody didn't take me seriously, then I wasn't worth being taken seriously, Mm -hmm. seriously, which means I really wasn't worth being loved. Mm -hmm. I wasn't good enough to be loved. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn how to replace these lies with the truth that that only God has the authority to tell me who I am. And my worth doesn't come from what somebody else thinks of me. My worth comes from Jesus alone. And he says that I am righteous and loved and secure. And so I had to begin to go through that process of taking the lies that I believed and replacing them with the truth. So that was a big one because when you do that, you you begin to heal and then you begin to be set free because you're not living out of those lies. You're not demanding them from people anymore. Um, So real quick, if you want to figure out your lies, here's just a really simple thing. Uh, Whenever you find yourself angry, anxious, which is fearfulness, angry, anxious, or depressed, Take a look at what preceded that. Mm -hmm. Like if you blow up in anger, what just happened? Because somebody, 99% of the time, there's going to be a lie there. Yeah, yeah. Um, And if you say things like, I would never, or I will never, mm, take a look at that. You might want to look at what's going on there. Ask the Lord. So angry, anxious, depressed, what happened? Ask the Lord. What Mm -hmm. triggered it? Get curious. Nine times out of 10, you're going to find a lie there. And God will show you when you ask him. Right. Um, I have a counselor that says, um, don't judge yourself. You can't heal if you're judging yourself. Mm -hmm. So instead of being like, oh, I'm so stupid for believing that or like whatever, however you might beat yourself up, don't. Just get curious. Right. God, what are you trying to show me here? Yeah. So we have to be willing to face our pain. I, and I think that willingness to become more self-aware is huge. A lot of mm-hmm. times we just take on the symptomology. Right. And some of us even have a hard time putting word to what the emotion is that we're feeling. Right. But some of us, you know, we've got the vocabulary for it, mm-hmm. but we stop there. And I think when we be- can become our own self-anthropologists in a way, like, mm. okay, really what's beneath that? Like, let's do a little bit further dig. What's, yeah. what's really underneath what's happening here? Yeah. Have you heard of Joe Harry's window? You no. wear that? Okay. Well, I, Teach sound, me. Okay. Well, I wish that it was something more exotic that's named Joe Harry. <laughs> it does sound a little exotic. I know. It sounds like, 
And it's a guy named Joe and a guy Mm -hmm. named Harry. I kid you not. They were researchers, psychologists who came up with this concept. And they were like, okay, now that we have this tool, what should we call it? And one of them was like, let's call it Joe Harry. It was like, sounds amazing. So that's why it's called Joe Harry's window. (laughs) But Joe Harry's window is this construct of a quadrant. Like imagine Mm -hmm. a four pane Mm -hmm. window. And one is what we know about ourselves and what everybody else knows about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then there is what we know about ourselves that no one else knows about. Mm -hmm. Then there is what everybody else knows about us that we don't know. And then that fourth quadrant is what's really unknown. Nobody Ooh, knows a, a bit about good. us and we don't know. The goal is to make that pane of the window that is what we know about ourselves and what other others know about ourselves to be the largest section mm. that we're really living in a place of great self-awareness. And that doesn't yeah. mean that we should have a window that is what we know about ourselves and no one else does. That's for those intimate relationships, that relationship with yes. God. It's not that we have to be complete disclosure all the right. time, but to continue to grow that window. And one of my continuing concerns in Christian ministry is how reduced our self-awareness is at mm. times because we don't stop and ask those questions. And well, it's because curious. we do this thing. Adam Young, who is a counselor, he has a podcast called The Place We Find Ourselves. It's mm-hmm. excellent. And he talks about um, what we do is when you have to slide in to this pain when you're going to deal with something like you you kind of like it's a U diagram he didn't come Mm -hmm. up with this Um, but anyway you go into it and what we as Christians do is we want to pop right up out of the pain and say but Jesus heals but Jesus saves but here's the truth and these are true things but you can't pop out of it like you have to continue the slide Mm -hmm. and let it have its process and let God do what he's going to do and so what you're saying is so true and the really great thing is in Psalm 139, um, there's a prayer we can pray and it's, it's search me, oh God, and yeah. know my heart, like yeah. see my offensive ways, see what's going on, test my anxious thoughts, and then lead me in the way everlasting. And so instead of popping up and not wanting to quite deal with it, we do this a lot in Christian circles because we don't like to deal with pain and sit in it for too mm-hmm. long, right? Because mm-hmm. then are we really following Jesus? Well, sure. Right. So anyway, so stay in that slide. God will show us. And I love how Adam Young says, it's always, always a surprise when there's redemption or when Mm. something happens. You can't anticipate it. You can't expect when it's going to happen. It will be a surprise. And all of a sudden, and just like, you know, with these core lies I was learning about, at some point you look back and you go, wow, like I really lost my rage. Like I don't have that anger anymore. Right, right. I couldn't pinpoint when it happened. There's no formula. But by obeying God, learning these things, you know, replacing lies with the truth, at some point there was a redemptive moment in my heart and God took that anger away. I couldn't have fixed that on my own. There's no way. And if I tried to figure it all out, on my own, quite frankly, I would be neurotic (laughs) because I have tried to do that before and surpass God's timing and it just doesn't work and it just makes you crazy. So if you want to love and forgive somebody who's hurting you, real practical, you got to deal with your own crap. Like you have to deal with your own junk, face your pain, be willing to face it. Yes, it's hard. Uh, Sometimes you're going to hate it. You're going to run. You're going to want to bolt. Don't stick with it. Mm -hmm. Um, The second thing is you're going to have to learn how to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. That's a huge one. We talk about this. I'm going to briefly say this one thing I learned when I learned to set boundaries. It was because I had met an alcohol counselor and I was telling him about the rhythm of my mother (laughs) and Mm -hmm. our conversations and how we could never get off the phone because, you know, I just was always trying to explain myself and mom, you're hurting me and then you're too sensitive and blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, and he said, um, if I have a ball in my hand and I throw it to you, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to catch it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, then what? And I said, well, I'm going to throw it back. And he said, so you've decided to play the game. Yeah. And he said, if you don't want to play the game, stop throwing the ball back. And that was my first introduction to the importance of boundaries. Like, what am I going to tolerate and what will I not tolerate? Right. And I think it's important that if we're going to love and forgive people who are toxic to us or who have abused us or hurt us, and you are not always called to stay in relationship, by the way, I specifically was, um, then you're going to have to learn how to set boundaries and say, Mm -hmm. like, I'm not okay with this, but I'm okay with this. Mm hmm. And then the third thing is that it's learning how to let go of our expectations of what we so desperately long for. I, under all of my rage, I was so sad. Like, I just really you wanted, a a who wanted a mom. I wanted a yeah. mom. Like, yeah. I had a daughter heart, yeah. and I so desperately wanted a mom. Yeah. And that doesn't ever go away. It gets easier because God has been kind and brought wonderful people into my life, but I had a counselor say, like, it's okay to always have a little bit of hurt. You can have joy and a good life even in the midst of some unmet needs. Mm -hmm. And that was huge. So I had to learn to mourn the loss of a mother as though she died. Because grieving, mourning, is the process of facing reality and letting go of expectations. So to mourn her 
that she was never going to be my mother. I didn't mourn the future because we don't mourn hope. Hope right. sits in the future. Right. But I mourned the reality that I did not have a mother. Mm-hmm. And that allowed me then to see her as a human made in the image of God in need of love. Right. right. So learning the truth, dealing with my own junk, um, learning how to set boundaries, and then letting go of my expectations. Those are the three key things that I would say if you're trying to figure out what to do with somebody, how to stay in a relationship, how to forgive and love. Those are three pretty key, key things to do. Absolutely. And I, I'll have Rebecca tag in the show notes, John mm-hmm. Townsend's book, Boundaries. I yes, mean, it's a absolutely. Classic. Absolutely. We had him on the podcast a few so, weeks ago. So, so good. He's my, he's, he's, he's definitely a girl crush for me. I yeah, just love he's him. Wonderful. He's wonderful. And that book is a great place yes. for people to start. Another one is called bold love. Okay. I can't think of who wrote it right now. We can find it. Um, but it's really, really good. Yeah. Bold love. Because it's it teaching you how to really love right. without having people walk all over you. It's right. excellent. And I think we need that. I think mm-hmm. somehow we've gotten in a place where we somehow perceive that a Christian kind of love uh-huh. And, you know, yes, Jesus did say, if someone smacks you on one side of the cheek, show them the other. I mean, I I know that there are those precepts in Mm -hmm. there, but I think he also taught us how Mm -hmm. to not internalize it, Mm -hmm. you know, how to somehow put up with some of those people in our world, because sometimes we are, we are called to stay, sometimes we are not, but how to manage that well. And somehow it's become something that I don't necessarily think is what he intended. So talk to me about this. Mm generational sin. Mm. What have you done with that? What do you think about that? Mm-hmm. You come from this mom who struggled so mightily mm-hmm. to, you know, deal with her alcoholism, what it really meant to be a mom, avoiding the things that were going on in yeah. ways that you were being hurt. So in generational sin, what I yeah. mean by that is, do you have her have a fear that she'll mm. replicate that? Does it mm. turn you so hard 180 degrees yeah. that sometimes it can make it complicated to have compassion to yeah. someone? Where do you stand on yeah. all that? My mind is darting in a million directions because there's so many things I want to say about this or could say about it. The first thing I want to say is this. Anybody who's been in dysfunction, dysfunction does not have to be your legacy. Right. It does not have to be your destiny, your identity. Like There is victory and you can be a generational bondage breaker. You don't have to continue the cycle. So that's important for people to know, like, just because you were in it or married into it or created it yourself, you don't have to keep doing it. Right. Like God can set us free. Um, As far as generational sin with my mom, it is fascinating because I can look back in my family history and see uh, uh, the women uh, having abortions, not just my mom. I think my grandmothers did. I don't know if my one did, but I think the other one did. And so that's really fascinating to me. So I'm just going to use that one example. So how do we break something like that? Well, we stop keeping secrets. Hmm. Abortion is something, especially in Christian circles, but really everywhere, even in the pro-choice movement, it's quiet. Like we don't, nobody really wants to talk about their abortion. Mm -hmm. We don't really want to face it. We don't really want to deal with it. Um, It's a secret. I can't tell you how many women I've talked to who never told anybody about their abortions, but how many women have had them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so what happens is if we continue to keep these things a secret and we don't deal with them and we don't talk about them, then what happens when our daughters have abortions? What do you think is going to happen? Like, are they going to tell? Are they going to talk about it? Are they going to? And it just continues on. So one of the things that God prompted me to do was um, tell my daughter when she was 12. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Uh, God, I don't know how to do that. I mean, how do you tell your daughter that they could have had a sibling? Like, how do you tell your daughter that essentially, I don't like using this term because it's so tender and sensitive. But when you're talking about a kid, like, how do you say like, I I killed your brother or sister. I mean, that's, I I hate saying, because I know there's people who are going to want to tune out when I say those words, but please know that like, I have no judgment towards you, like only compassion because abortion is such a tender thing. Um, And the people who usually have one, they didn't want to. (laughs) Most of the time they felt like they had no choice. So all to say though, is telling a child is very, very difficult. So I, uh, but God called me to do it. So I told my daughter when she was 12 and after we talked about it and she read my story and she cried and we hugged it freed something because then I was able to include her in my ministry. Like she comes and sees me talk. She hears me share my testimony about my abortion. She has come to um, crisis pregnancy clinic banquets to fundraise um, for them. And so she is like a part of that. Now there's no darkness. There's no secrets. We talk about it. Like Ella, if you come home pregnant one day, like, like talk to us about it. Like, you know, like let's walk through this together. You're not alone. Um, I just think it's so important that we 
break out of the dark and align ourselves with the light. And in the light, there is truth and there's reality and the truth will set us free. And so um, I think how we break generational sin is we acknowledge it and we don't keep it in the dark anymore. Mm -hmm. We bring it out into the light and we deal with it. Um, I think that is huge. I'm always telling women, tell your secrets. It doesn't mean you have to tell them to the world, but you do need to find a spouse or a safe person or, or a counselor, and you need to tell it and, and walk it through so that you don't pass it on unintentionally to your children or towards young women you're mentoring or whoever's coming up after you. Right. And I, and I think we've created this romance around previous generations and you and I were talking earlier about, you know, there are some books you just don't write till some people die, which sounds it's terrible. True. You know, but, it's true. But I've gotten so tickled because there was definitely the construct of the very, you know, prim, proper Southern world that mm. my extended family came from. And then I started having the experience of going, well, you know, great grandma so-and-so or so-and-so yeah. did this or that. And I'm like, wait, wait, what? Right. <laughs> Things that had never come out before. Uh-huh. And you begin to discover no, it's not that we're in a generation that is so much more wicked or turned away. It's just we've gotten a lot bolder, I think, yeah. in very good ways about telling our truth. Good girls and, don't tell you know, yeah, the bad things. Right. And I think the more we get bold and do it wisely and have right. correct boundaries and do it without a motive of malice, but right. more of a motive toward healing, yeah. then, you know, yes, it's always going to be complicated. It's going to be right. complicated in our own These hearts. These things aren't easy. It's not easy. And nobody said it should be. Like right. God never said like, hey, this is going to be an easy road if you're a Christian or anybody, quite frankly, on this earth. Like, right. no, that right. is not what it's going to be. Right. And to be willing to sit in the messiness of it. Yes. To have a complicated compassion toward people who've hurt oh, us. Oh, I like I that. Complicated compassion. complicated compassion. Well, I'm That's good. inspired That's good by phrase. this book by my friend Sam <laughs> called The Complicated Heart. So yeah, just saying. But I think those things are so mm. powerful. And Sarah, I think that's part of the legacy that you have brought to the table for so many women through those nascent stages of blogging mm. into your writing career. And so I just want to thank you for your honesty Aww. and forthrightness as you continue mm -hmm. to disclose what this process is, that you own that it still is a process. Yes, absolutely. I mean, things I think I'm healed from, I'm like, Psh, I've dealt with that. I'm good. God will bring something up. And I'm like, Oh, we're not done with that. Yeah, yeah. Like there's still more there. Okay, let's do it. Like, you know, yeah. but it gets, it's never easy, but it gets easier. It's just like working out, building muscles. Like the more you face your pain, the more you go through it, the more you know you, you can trust God with it and you, you can handle it. Um, anxiety says, uh, I can't handle this. But the truth is, yes, you can. Yeah. And if you can't, then go see a counselor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is always a good, good piece of advice. Right. Mm -hmm. Sarah, again, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Connect with Sarah May at Sarah May Writes on Instagram and check out the show notes for other resources and ways to connect with her. All Mom Does on the socials and on the web is a place for you to find your people, other women who are in the midst of the mom thing, juggling kids, romance, jobs, and faith. Be sure and head there for all kinds of good. I'd love for you to come tell me hi. You'll find me on Instagram at Julie Lyles Carr, really on all the places social at my name, Julie Lyles Carr. Don is our producer. Rebecca is our content coordinator, and they make sure this content gets out to you each week. You can show them how much you appreciate them by going to wherever you get your podcasts, subscribing, and leaving a five-star rating and review. It really does help get the word out, and I'd love to feature your review, just like it at the top of the show for Acting and Africa. I would love to feature your review on an upcoming episode. We'll see you next time on the Modern Motherhood Podcast. <laughs>